So in uh, the meantime, uh, Francine and uh, Flores have joined us. They take uh, always challenging part, but nevertheless also exciting part of the last spot on the agenda. So they're going to, going to talk about the uh, omni-channel. Um, so uh, may I introduce you uh, Francine van Dierendonk. She's a director of e-commerce and executive board member at uh, the ATOM group. And uh, Flores Riquet, uh, who's the head of digital marketing at Samsung. Please give the word to you. Hello, everyone. Um, Yep, it is. Very good. Hey, um, first let's do some engagement testing. I'm sorry, Francine, but I, uh, I just was, uh, I just jumped in. Um, so who is all from the Netherlands? There we go. Who is from outside the Netherlands? And then there are some, some people that are from space? Where? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, so I think, yeah, we, uh, we are here to talk about uh, Omnichannel. And uh, maybe to make an engagement, I'm not sure whether you like it, Francine, to, to stand up. Would that be okay? Um, since uh, I think, yeah, uh, having this session later at the day, uh, I hope at least we can uh, bring you some knowledge to the table on Omnichannel, at least from, uh, from our both experiences. Um, so Francine, maybe a short introduction from your side to start off. So, um, is my mic? Yeah. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Um, I joined uh, the company I worked for nine months ago. Um, I work for 13 years now in e-commerce. I'm an engineer from background. I worked for a management consulting firm, the Boston Consulting Group. Um, afterwards, I worked for a publisher and then seven years for eBay and then a few years for Philips. And I'm now working in retail, in fashion retail, ladies fashion. So I'm not a fashion expert at all, but I do think I'm an e-commerce expert. And um, the interesting thing about the, um, the journey I've embarked on is that I'm a full board member. So I am equally, um, my role is equal to the um, uh, guy in our case who is running the bricks. So I run the clicks. I'm end responsible, everything we do in clicks both marketing and commercially. Um, and um, the retailer I work for is um, very traditional. It's 90 years old. It's a family business. And uh, somehow the owners, the family is still 100% owner of the company, have decided that um, they need to do something about omnichannel. In fact, they sort of realized they had to invest in a new business model, being clicks, next to their traditional business model, being bricks. Now, uh, this doesn't come easy, I can already tell you. Um, but um, the fact that the owner is totally committed to go towards an omnichannel company, and they don't know how that exactly looks like um, at all, but the fact that they are committed to go there is, at least in the Dutch business, quite special. Because most companies are either under-investing in clicks or don't have the management attention and the, continu the, the focus on the continuity of the business so that they actually can invest in the new business model. Um, or they just uh, completely don't understand what's, <laughs> what's happening in the world. Now. I think there are a lot of companies that actually do realize they have to invest, but they are either private equity owned or just don't have the money to uh, run for a while two business models next to each other. Obviously, obviously, at the end of the day, the two business models have to somehow merge because otherwise we wouldn't call it omnichannel, but at this moment in time, we actually run those two next to each other. I think that is sort of a nice introduction, um, but um, yeah. It depends on you uh, if you want me to continue, Flores. <laughs> so let, let's let's have a nice discussion on some uh, some omnichannel uh, activities. But first, maybe also good to introduce myself. Um, now, also a year, or oh just a little bit more than a year, uh, now responsible for all the, the digital marketing, e-commerce, and CRM activities at Samsung, Benelux. So for Belgium and the Netherlands, um, in a very uh, yeah growing, uh, astonishing brand that I uh, that I really uh, felt some uh, some love for in the end. 
uh, because it's really an entrepreneurship in a very large organization. Um, the funny thing is that Francine and I already share uh, some, uh, some nice experience before, so we both worked at Philips very closely together, um, and also before that uh, at uh, Marktplatz and eBay, so uh, we know each other quite well, so it's kind of funny that based on our shared experiences, we hope to, uh, to bring you some engagement today as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, working at Samsung, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crazy brand. In that sense, uh, there is innovation from, uh, from really uh, a lot of people. Um, maybe, maybe we do some guessing. So there's 430,000 people working at Samsung worldwide. And uh, then, of course, there is a part of consumer electronics. How many people would you think are working on innovation every day? Give me a number. Fifty thousand is close, but it's not there yet. We go up. One more. Eighty. We go less. A little bit. No, it's it's seventy thousand people working on innovation every day, and that means that uh, we build all these kind of devices that uh, hopefully you all use. How many people are using or having a Samsung device at home? Oh, that's not that's not that big. Um, it's about 50% still, so we still have some, uh, some souls to win. Um, and I hope I can do that as well. I think uh, what I just want to close up with, I think uh, based on, uh, on this innovative uh, activities we do in Samsung, also digital has become a really strong point uh, for us uh, in the organization, meaning that uh, normally being pushed by our retailers and really closely working as a manufacturing, uh, activating all our sales through, um, uh, through our retailers. We now see a very clear transformation moving into uh, direct sales activities as well, but also making sure, and that's much more important, to really become uh, a personal brand that we can uh, drive aspiration with our consumers directly. And I think uh, in this whole omnichannel discussion, I think it all starts with the consumer and uh, it doesn't start directly with the brand itself. So, Francine, so how, how would we continue? What kind of topic would we, uh, would we like to give to this audience? Well, uh, it might be um, interesting to, um, to share um, a few things that uh, keep um, me and then after a few busy yep. during the day, not so much at night, but uh, during the day. And um, my company, because it's a traditional retailer, really goes through a, um, I would say, classical transformation. And um, there are five things that are on my daily agenda. One is think big, act small. In any transformation that you do and that you build, if you rebuild or sort of reshape a company, I think you need to be sure which direction you're going, but at the same time you need to make sure that you do it step by step and that you really build it up from the bottom up. The second thing that um, keeps me busy is um, customer focus. And I guess that has been a topic that has been mentioned uh, a couple of times today, if not a lot today, um, but I think it's crucial. So one of the things that, have th that, that people ask me, including um, the owners, when do we get a digital mirror? Or when do we get an app that does this, this and this? Or when do we, yeah, and you can continue that, um, and my structural answer is when the customer wants it. Because I sh we should not invest in gimmicks unless we want to have some PR. We should actually invest in the things that our lady customers, because we only serve ladies, lady customer wants. So if she wants a gimmick, or it's not a gimmick anymore, it's something that drives conversion and loyalty. If not, we should not do it. Um, one other thing that keeps me busy is IT. So I think I helped to um, make this company realize that IT is no longer a hygiene factor for the company. So something you need to do your logistical efforts to make sure that your products get to the store. No, it's really something that is a sales driver and therefore a strategic asset. And um, I think that is uh, something that so far, it's been very much underestimated in the comp in within the company when talking about omnichannel. Um, I um, 
um, um, so one of the other things that um, um, really is important for us um, next to that IT thing. Oh, it's sorry, I, 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 meant I want to mention one thing. That's why I was struggling. So having said it's a strategic um, asset, IT, I managed to actually hire an IT manager, so responsible for all IT, not only the digital part, also the logistical part, etc., from eBay. So I managed to actually make sure that everyone understood we should not look for someone out from the old world, but actually someone from the new world. Because if you put people in the right position to actually uh, to make sure that you get your transformation done, everything moves much easier. And I can already tell you, the guy started um, six weeks ago, and I only have to talk to him with three sentences of a few words, and he understands what I said. Whereas the first eight months, I really struggled to get really the not sort of um, the understanding of what I wanted to do and how which direction I wanted to move. So that was, I think, a really big thing. And then last but not least, um, the transformation itself. I think in any company I've seen, any, in my consulting time, also eBay, also Philips, and now again, um, transformation actually means you have to deal with fear because people do not like to change. In fact, one of the things, one of the, I would almost say wise words that I read uh, not so long ago was from a Dutch guy who wrote down, change will only happen if people um, are less fearless for the future. Uh, sorry, if they are, I, I tried to uh, translate it, uh, if they uh, are so much uh, unhappy with the present that they no longer fear the future. So unhappiness with the current situation needs to be bigger than the unknown and therefore the fear for what's coming. And um, I think that is one of the reasons why if you do a transformation, you need to make sure that you take things step by step because otherwise people can't follow you. That's also the reason why I think it's very important if you want to create a comp go from a traditional company towards an omnichannel or new company that you actually select people around you that not only the IT manager but also people around you from the current company that actually take the leadership and are willing to set steps into that direction. The people that are not so fearless or fearless that actually want to move that way because on your own you can't do it. So it's really uh, something I try to do with people within the organization to make them realize, so what's the bigger vision? And then what can we do today to actually make it happen? And then actually try to select people around me that actually have sort of that drive that they want to move towards that direction without me telling them to do it, that they do it by themselves. Now th those are the, mo the things that keep me busy and are on my mind during the, the, um, the day. So IT, um, think big, but make it happen in small steps. The customer really looking for what she wants. And then, um, yeah, the transformation, how do I actually get people moving in the direction that, um, that we would like to get there? Yeah, so the, the, the w one thing that I learned, and, and probably also you can concur on that one, is that most of the changes, because I, I do agree that, uh, that you know, change is very difficult for people. And I think digital and transformation, in especially into omnichannel, is something that requires uh, a lot of effort from people. And I think where you can, uh, where probably you can agree that most of these things happen in the coffee machine as well. So normally you would sometimes have discussions with people uh, that sometimes work better at the coffee machine, which might sound a little bit silly. Of course, there needs to be a plan, but sometimes because of this fear, you need to take it uh, into a personal situation as well sometimes to uh, get people over it. I think um, looking in, into the ways on, uh, I think y you need to shape with a vision and, uh, and Stephen Covey, you know, keep the end in mind. And I think that's also important in these kind of activities. So maybe just to a quick question to the audience. Um, f currently f within their organization, 
are you currently in a sort of a multi-channel situation or maybe a single channel situation? Who, who is in a single channel situation currently delivering their services? So that would be one, two. Um, and then a multi-channel. So who's driving services and marketing activities through multiple channels currently? And who is already integrating that in cross-channel activities? All right. And then <laughs> we ourselves. Um, and then omni-channel. Who is already who is already in the state of omni-channel, in doing omni-channel marketing? So you see that there is this ambition that we all probably have is now how to get there, and definitely focusing on change and making sure that you have the right people surrounding you to go for this ambition. And I think also in Samsung we have a, a, a big model which means this discovery starts here. And I think if you don't start with these kind of activities, trying to find out how you can bring connections to your customers, then uh, you, you will fail definitely because you don't do anything. And, I, and, and maybe good to give you one example, which is always an example I use in my CRM uh, activities, um, which is my, uh, my mailman. My mailman, he's named Hassan. And Hassan is uh, uh, quite, a, quite a good guy. And I think, you know, telling him a little bit on how he's using his channels in order to make his delivery most successful, I think that would be definitely something to take along. Um, Hassan, uh, when I started, when I w joined here in Amsterdam seven years ago, um, I got this mail form in my, in my box with a stamp on it. And on the stamp, it said Hassan with his mobile phone number. And the funny thing was that, you know, the first time I saw it, I said, mm, maybe not, and uh, maybe I'll, I'll do it next time. So the next time, another online delivery, again, uh, a, a paper from Hassan. So I said, oh, why not give him a call? So I gave him a call, and he was answering the phone. and said, Hassan, uh, this is me, this is Flores, I'm, I'm, I'm a new guy in the, in the area. And he said, well, when are you home? I said, well, I'm, uh, I'm home around 6. Oh, said, no problem. I'm, I'm going to be there at 6, and I'm going to deliver you the package. So I was like, wow, this was a strange experience. So then Hassan came over, and then the next time I called Hassan, and he said, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, Flores from 149D. I said, yeah, that's correct. How do you know? Well, yeah, 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 you know, I track all these kind of things. And basically, he already noticed that I was, uh, you know, that he, it, when are you home? I said, yeah, well, at uh, 5.30 or whatever. And then again, Hassan appeared. The funny thing was, the next time I wasn't home again, then Hassan came over, and he called me. He said, Hi, I'm Hassan, I'm, uh, I'm in front of your door. And then at that time, I'm already, and I still have it, it's called Hassan Postbode, mailman, in my, uh, in my phone. But then the funny thing was that the next time he came for another delivery, it was like uh, standing at my neighbor's house saying, hey, I'm at your neighbor's house, can I deliver the, the, the postal package to, uh, to your neighbor? I said, yeah, sure, no problem. So then the last time, when uh, so already a long time ago, I bought a TV. At that time, it wasn't a, a, a Samsung yet. But... Um, I, I bought this television, and, and basically I, I had to pay the mailman cash. So, uh, but I wasn't prepared for that. So I only had my credit card, my plastic, and I think, yeah, okay, let's let's see if Hassan uh, can can accept that. No, no, no deal. It was like 6:30 on a Friday afternoon, so we already he had to be home, and I was already home. Um, so we walked along in the streets to still find some shops where I could collect the, the cash. And in that sense, you know, at, uh, we all finished everything. Hassan went. Uh, to the place where he was uh, delivering his money. And at that time, he gave me a call saying, yeah, it's nine euros short. I said, oh, you got to be kidding. He said, yeah, he said, no problem. I'll, I will collect it next time. And still until now, Hassan is still calling me uh, when he has a package. Last time, it was like two days ago, uh, my girlfriend wasn't opening the door. So Hassan gave me a call. And I called my girlfriend, and basically he opened. Uh, she, she opened the door, and, and finally Hassan was able to deliver his package. So the reason why I'm telling you this, and this is this is the only channel, may, but maybe in a, in a very small thing, that you know you shift from one step, one channel communication, whether it's the form, whether it's the face-to-face -face communication, or whether it's the the personal communication you have on the phone or uh, in private. I think most important is that in these cases Hassan uses tools. So he has basically the tools to really move forward and understand everything mo using his, his different channels. Then he uses his memory in order to store that information, knowing everything about me, and then also put the effort in to do it. And I think the last bit is most important. If you want to do these kind of things, you really need to put effort in it. And I think Hassan is a proven example on, on, on a very small scale, of course, on how he can be very successful in delivering packages. And I think this is something I use day to day in my, in my work as well, to see how can I translate these kind of entrepreneurial thoughts into uh, how we want to uh, be 
delivering through omnichannel activities uh, the best uh, experience to our consumers. I would say, so I don't have a, a mailman like you, <laughs> but um, I do work for a company that's uh, reward winning. So year after year, we actually um, get rewards uh, for being the best retailer in the Netherlands. And that reward actually comes from the bricks because people like our staff. They like the way we actually treat them in store. We're specialized in um, all sizes. So from petite to um, plus, we um, uh, have a collection for very tall women, but also for short women and for women that are pregnant. So we basically do all shapes. And um, if you are a woman, or you happen to know a woman, then you know that every woman actually has a different shape. And that every women, woman actually complains about something being um, back, being breasts, being arms, being everything. And our staff is trained in such a way that we actually can um, make the women happy that come to our stores and actually walk out of the store with a happy feeling about themselves, about the, dre and the way they dress, etc. Now, the big question, obviously, is how do you do that online? Because some clients actually call our client services center. Um, in general, they're quite happy with that moment of truth. Um, I say in general, not always. Um, but that's the only human interaction that you then have. So I'm trying to work out with my team, how do you get the emotion of fashion and how do you get the emotion of size, one of our USPs, and actually understanding size of women and understanding how they can look in the best possible way in a digital uh, age or in a digital way. And I can tell you that is not that simple. <laughs> Because there's a lot of art and uh, not so much science about this. So what we're trying to do now is do, no, no, I have to say, one of the first steps that we did, um, actually what we um, finished two weeks ago, was to build a client database because we did not have anything that had to do with CRM. Nothing. So we have, in general, two sales channels, bricks and clicks. And now we have a database in which we have all our customers from the past 18 months, um, plus their, uh, the things they bought. And that might actually seem like a very basic thing, and it is a very basic thing, but you can't actually move on to something that comes near as close what we do in with human interaction in the bricks. If you start, don't start with the first thing. So first things first. We now have that and we're now going to experiment and actually ask our customers, how is this going to work for you online? So how can we serve you? And I think that's the only way to actually figure out how we can serve her. Because there are many examples, especially in America, of how you can actually um, play with shape and play with uh, personalized uh, content. But to do it in that way that our customer wants it is my goal for the next year. And to uh, build everything around that that uh, makes that happen for the web shop, but obviously also for bricks. Because if we can actually bring the, we actually already brought the web shop in the bricks, but if we can actually um, bring this sort of more scientific part of the whole thing into the bricks, I'm very sure that the women our sales force can actually even do a better job if they know what our customers have bought in the past, even if it's someone who just bought once a year and not every month that they might not know until well, and actually what their favorite um, items are. So no uh, mail guy, yeah. but a similar story on but how can we now actually uh, bring the Hassan feeling that you ha got, got from him 
how can we actually translate that into a, uh, a digital um, experience for our customers? Yeah, and I think especially in, in talking about these ex extensive volumes, and especially if you look also at, at the communications we do on a day-to-day -day basis also within Samsung, but also in online transactions y you do at your side, um, basically you need to be personal, you need to be relevant, and you need to be there at the right time. And I think these kind of things you need to understand who is my consumer, what is he doing, and what kind of information can I, after once we had a first handshake, whether that would be in a display ad or whether that would be an actual transaction, you need to continue strengthening this relation time and time. And I think that's where the challenge comes in. And, and I think especially, you know, going and uh, convincing people from, from bricks to clicks uh, and, and the same side where we are from, from also from retailer distribution to also direct communication. I think these kind of challenges are very difficult. And I think everybody can understand these, uh, the, these, ch these challenges. Um, what is most important now here, and at least the, 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 the insights I can give you, is, is to make it as transparent as possible for all the people you're talking to. Give, give the people direction, but mostly start with, you know, what is the initial objectives and how can you turn these objectives based on the right audience into the right activity. And make sure, start with knowing your audience and, and basically by building up a CRM system. For example, we started up with a My Samsung environment, which is basically a connection with all the different screens people are can engage with. Basically also when they are contacting Samsung, at least we store that information into one into one place. And we provide, based on that knowledge we build up, we, we start to, to communicate with you into much more relevant communication. And in some cases, you really don't know who you're dealing with, so you need to find out learnings. And then we were talking about privacy here previously. But at least within boundaries of privacy, and, and for some even, especially for the young guys, uh, there is probably no even privacy because everybody's opening up their Facebook profiles, for example. But um, I think learning from who's your audience and then making step by steps, I think that really brings you into the omnichannel strategy because you really need to understand on an individual basis how to serve your customers best. And I think that's something I'd like to give with you as well in, in, in a way that you need to talk with all the people and try to make it stick. And in, in a way that you start shaping up the consumer journey, making sure you understand the different steps and different needs the consumer has at certain points and that you address that in a, in a rightful way. Uh, and, and, you know, and then these kind of activities additionally you can drive engagement with is, is for example, gamification, where you could even take that uh, uh, a few steps further, where you start really actively involving, engaging your consumers uh, during the, 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 the loyalty phase you have basically with your consumers. So I think that's, that's definitely something I'd like to, to say to, the, to you guys, uh, you know, understand your audience and, and make sure you can relevantly communicate uh, at the right time. I'm not sure how we're doing with time, uh, Joop. Ten seconds. Francine, is there anything you'd like to uh, to give uh, as a last word then to the audience? No, so I'm, I'm, I'm just really curious um, what is um, the things that keep you busy in if it if it comes to an omnichannel world or omnichannel subject in your companies. A any questions? Yeah. The only question I have, people are talking about big data the last year, but uh, I think uh, the levers of, of commercial success are also always of have always been consumer insights. So the struggle I always, uh, if you have all those data, how do you make actionable insights from this data? Do you have do you have that in place yet? Yeah. So so from our side and, and then probably Francine as well has a, has a lot of information. Um, I think uh, data absolutely is, is a no-brainer, especially now also in a digital environment. If you don't have data, you don't understand how consumers are orienting on the website, et cetera, et cetera, then uh, you know, you're stuck. But you, know, you can start with first having an email address, for example, or starting up with an ID and, and then start to connect other sources with it. I, I think you know, a lot of people will try to, to boil the ocean at once and thinking, yeah, I need to go to Omnichannel and that's the greatest big thing. Uh, you know, keep that in mind, but, but start in, in, in small steps by, on an individual basis, take track of additional information that is relevant for the relationship you have. Maybe you can uh, also... Yeah, I'm a big believer in the power of and. So still do the traditional marketing stuff that you did. Yeah, with uh, focus groups and questioners and that sto so sort of stuff. Uh, and try to couple it with big data. 
because the only way to actually um, get yourself around it is to work hypothesis driven and to set the right hypothesis you need to get some understanding of your, what your customers want so you need to rely on that sort of traditional part so my answer would be just do both and try to work out where, um, uh, where you can really get to understand your consumers now there's something else about big data and that is you can think of big data as a big database where you have all sorts of data in where you can hypothetically driven draw some conclusions you can also try to work unstructured and that's what some digital tools try to do so for example um, based on um, click path on the web sh web store um, you try to actually serve different content based on I would not say self-learning algorithm, but it goes that, uh, that way. And um, I think that part is also super interesting, but I think you should never go there if you don't get the other thing, if you really understand sort of the, the basics of big data. Thanks. Any more questions? Think when it works. <laughs> I haven't seen solutions where it really works. So it's still nice, yeah, it's still gimmicky, yeah. So you, but when it works is um, when you get suggestions on the mirror, color suggestions that actually fit your skin, where you actually get uh, suggestions on the mirror that actually tell you, well, if you, if, if you have uh, you tall le legs, yeah, you should actually opt for this type of color or this type of shape or whatever. And so far, the, algor the algorithms aren't that far yet. And I think the reason for that is not because we can't program it. The reason is that it's art and not science. So the Amazons of this world are very good at science. And if you uh, talk about consumer electronics, that works. Yeah, but if you talk about fashion, it sort of doesn't work that way, and it becomes more complex from the algorithm point of view. So when do they want it if it works? 